Dark clouds peek over the horizon on a hot summer day. Soon the hot summer sun is covered by these storm clouds. And the first crack of thunder seems to open the floodgates. Giant summer raindrops fall to the ground. Peals of thunder, flashes of lightning, howling wind, bending trees, dancing leaves. And there, in the midst of the storm, is a bird on her nest. With newly born chicks, she spreads her wings over them to protect them from the storm. Her wings are a refuge for the chicks, a shelter from the beating rain and hail, a source of warmth and calm, because her wings are a refuge from the storm. Ruth will ask Boaz to spread his wings over her, to shelter her, to protect her, to provide for her, and even marry her. The scene will be for us a glimpse into the kindness of God toward all who take refuge in him. Last week, our study of the book of Ruth, we covered chapter one Sunday morning. We covered chapter two Sunday evening. Let me briefly recap for us the story thus far. The book is a short narrative surrounding the family of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem named Elimelech. The story play, takes place during the time of the judges and we learn that there was an extreme famine in the land. And this famine, it prompts the family to go and to sojourn in Moab. So Elimelech takes with him his wife, Naomi, and his two sons, Malon and Chilion. We learn early that Elimelech dies. And the two boys marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And in the course of time, the two boys die as well, leaving Naomi, a widow, with two daughters-in-law to care for. Naomi decides to return to Judah because she had heard that Yahweh had visited his people and provided food for them. So the three ladies pack up and head out. If you remember, out of love, Naomi encourages her two daughters-in-law to go back to Moab. And eventually, after several rounds of pleading, Orpah returns to Moab, but Ruth remains with Naomi. Naomi, her homecoming to Bethlehem, it's a bitter one. She comes home and she no longer wants to be called Naomi, which means pleasant. She wants to be called Mara, which means bitter. She described her journey as leaving full and returning empty. She left with her husband, two sons, and Yahweh, and she returns with no husband, no sons, and seemingly Yahweh against her. But what we saw was that God was not against her. He was near to her, providing for her, providing Ruth, and bringing her back to Bethlehem at the perfect time, barley harvest. So we came to chapter two and the author of the book lets us in on a little secret. There is a man, a kinsman of the family of Elimelech and his name is Boaz. Ruth goes out to glean from the leftovers of the barley harvest and she just so happens to go and to glean in the field that is owned by Boaz. And the two unexpectedly meet, and Boaz shows unexpected kindness to Ruth. He is impressed by her devotion to Naomi. He praises her and pronounces a blessing over her work. From this point forward, Boaz's kindness to Ruth is simply over the top. He lets her eat and, and drink with the other servants. He 
commands her protection. She can glean from any part of the harvest. And he instructs his servants to throw down good grain in front of her where she is gleaning. By the end, when she comes home from that first day, she brings home a truckload of grain to Naomi. And the climax of the the chapter is when Naomi finds out that the man who owns the field that, that Ruth has been working at is Boaz. Naomi, Naomi knows him and references him as a goel. Look back at chapter 2, verse 20 with me. Chapter 2, verse 20 says, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. The word there that's translated closest relative is goel, which means redeemer. Chapter 2 closes with Ruth continuing to work for Boaz at his field through both the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And if you remember, the author wants us, the reader, to see that the meeting between Ruth and Boaz is divine providence. She did not just so happen to go to the field of the wealthy, godly, potential kinsman redeemer. No, God in his sovereignty orchestrated the meeting. God was sovereign over this meeting just as he is sovereign over all of history and including us. Which brings us to the chapter we are going to look at this morning. Several months have taken place between chapter 2 and chapter 3. Ruth has now worked through the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, and they were typically separated by about a month. And so it's safe to say that probably close to two months have transpired since the end of chapter 2, since that first day that Ruth and Boaz met. Now, I want to break our chapter into four main sections. And so let us begin with Naomi's instructions, verses 1 through 5. The story picks up with Naomi desiring security for Ruth. Look at verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now, this is the same desire that Naomi had already expressed for Ruth and Orpah as she wanted them to return to Moab. She told the girls, may the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. That's in chapter 1, verse 9. And the word there that's translated rest is the same word that's translated security here. So we can gather that Naomi wants For Ruth, a family. She wants Ruth to find a husband and perhaps even children. And Naomi sees this as her duty. Shall I not seek this security for you? Now what is Naomi about to do? She is going to do what every good mother with a single child who is older would do. She is going to play matchmaker. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Naomi's goal is to get Ruth and Boaz together. And her strategy is sort of a blind date. Look at verse 2. Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. Boaz just makes sense to Naomi. Now, is not Boaz our kinsman? Have you not been working with him? (laughs) Naomi understands that, that Boaz and Ruth, it just makes sense. 
He's the potential kinsman redeemer and Ruth has been there for almost two months working for him. Now the author doesn't tell us, but she's been working probably for him for about 60 days. And if the last 59 days were anything like the first one, we can see that Boaz has just constantly lavished kindness on Ruth and Naomi. And so Naomi probably has what we call mama's intuition. She can clearly see that Boaz loves Ruth. And so she stages a meeting, the threshing floor tonight. Naomi tells Ruth to go and to wash herself, put on some oil and put on your best clothes. And before we move on to the rest of the instructions, let me just make a comment about this. Again, commentators can be so cruel and so off at times. Some say that she's dressing like a prostitute because that's what Moabites did. In Numbers 25, verses 1 and 2, we see that there were some Moabite women that did seduce Israelites. And so they say she must just be acting like a Moabite. Others speculate that she's changing from her mourning clothes into I'm ready to date clothes. Some say that she's dressing for a wedding. Well, we really don't know. But I can say this for sure. No matter what culture you are in, no matter what time period you live in, a good bath, clean clothes, some smell good is a good idea for a first date. <laughs> From Adam to today, those are all great principles. Teenagers, put it in your back pocket. So Naomi has prepped Ruth on good hygiene for the meeting. And now it's time for the location and the details of this meeting. Look back at verse 3. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies. And you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. And then he will tell you what you shall do. Naomi knows that Boaz will be at the threshing floor. He, she knows that he will be spending the night there because this is a time in which work went far into the evening and in which the grain needed to be protected. And so Naomi knows that Boaz will be there. And so she tells Ruth to go and to watch him secretly. And after he's had his last meal and he's fallen asleep, that she is to go and to lie down and uncover his feet. Naomi tells Ruth after that, Boaz will tell you what to do. Look at verse 5. She said to her, all that you say, I will do. And so Ruth tells Naomi, I will do all that you tell me, mama. I will obey you. Which brings us to the second section, Ruth's invitation. Verses six through nine. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. She follows all of Naomi's instructions. She watches in secret. She waits until he falls asleep, and she comes in secretly and uncovers his feet and lays down. This event is really interesting because it's so unique in Scripture. Matter of fact, it only takes place here. And of course, we would never recommend this to any of our young ones in dating today. It is interesting. Some speculate about it, about it being a cultural signal, and others, again, cruelly, I believe, present her as a prostitute. That she's making some indecent proposal here to Boaz some speculate about the uncovering of his feet. That it was simply just to wake him up as the cool air would run over his feet. 
and he would wake up. Well, I hate to keep saying that we're not sure and that the author doesn't tell us, but we really aren't sure. The author doesn't tell us what the meaning of all of this is, but it is very clear that the intended message that Naomi instructed Ruth to give to Boaz, it was read loud and clear. Boaz knew exactly what she was saying, exactly what she was asking. Look back at verse eight. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and he bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. We see this word, behold. There really should be an exclamation mark here. It's used about a thousand times in the Old Testament. It's an emphatic word of look, see. When something is overwhelmingly unexpected or interesting. And so Boaz says, behold, a woman at my feet. What a shock. Look at verse 9. He said, who are you? Remember, it's in, the, it's in the middle of the night. He can't see. It's the blind date. <laughs> Who are you? She answered, I, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. He can't see her. Ruth reveals herself, and she says, spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Now this verse, again, for some, it, it gets them off and they think something here of, about Ruth and what she's asking. But here, here's what the, the Hebrew literally reads here. She says, spread your wings over your maid, for you are a Goel, you are a redeemer. Go, go back to chapter 2, verse 12 with me. Chapter 2, verse 12. Boaz is speaking to Ruth uh, about her coming and staying in Bethlehem. And listen to what he says. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Boaz describes Ruth's coming to Bethlehem as seeking refuge under the wings of Yahweh. He is using it as a metaphor to describe Ruth seeking care, protection, and provision from the Lord, from Yahweh. The metaphor is the image of a bird protecting their young by spreading their wings over them. It is interesting. This is the first time in scripture that that metaphor is used in that way. It is the first time that the protection and provision of Yahweh is described as a bird covering its young with its wings. The next time that we see it, will be in the Psalms by none other than David. Listen to Psalm 17, 8. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. And can we let our imagination go for a minute? And maybe David took the metaphor from the story of his great-grandparents. And how his great-grandmother came and sought refuge under the shadow of the wings of Yahweh. And then here that, she, that Ruth sought to be under the wings of Boaz. I believe we read Ruth's invitation the same as Boaz used it. Ruth is seeking refuge under the wings of Boaz. She is inviting him to redeem her. Look back at verse 9, the, the second half. She says, for you are a close relative. 
there is that word again, go el. It means to redeem. And so all throughout the rest of chapter three and chapter four, anytime that you see the word redeem, redeemer, close relative, it is this word go el, redeem. And so Ruth is asking Boaz to redeem her. This is different than the kinsman word. She is specifically asking him to marry her. She is not presenting herself as a prostitute. Which brings us to the third section. Boaz's response. At this point, the situation could go either really good or it could go really bad. Look at verse 10. Then he said, May you be blessed of Yahweh, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. The response is overwhelmingly good. Boaz blesses her for her actions. He says, may Yahweh bless you. Why? Because she chose him. She chose him. And so he says, may the Lord bless you. You picked me. Because you and I both know, and Naomi knew, Boaz loved Ruth. She could have gone after younger men, but she chose Boaz. And Boaz, he viewed this as a kindness. And it's interesting, he says that your first kindness And I think he's referencing Ruth's leaving of Moab with Naomi. And now her second kindness of choosing Boaz. For whatever reason, Boaz is somewhat surprised by Ruth's invitation. I think because he's older. He's probably closer to Naomi's age. And that is perhaps why he doesn't pursue her in the story. Nevertheless, we continue on, verse 11. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do whatever you ask, (laughs) whatever. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Boaz knows exactly what Ruth is asking. He knows exactly her request. There is something about what she has done. There is something cultural that we just don't know about something that we would not recommend our children to do, but that was significant back then. Boaz knows she is asking him to redeem her, to marry her. And he responds with a resounding, I will, I will do whatever you ask. He is smitten. He is smitten with her. He's been smitten with her since the beginning. He loves her character. He says that she is a woman of excellence and that everyone in the city knows it. That's interesting. I mean, word travels fast, but why does all of Boaz's people in the city know about Ruth? Well, perhaps there's been a lot of water cooler conversations during the day about this woman named Ruth working in his field. And I'm sure every time he came to his fields, he had a a special eye on that field that Ruth was working in. And for the last two months, he's watched her. And he's just been smitten with her character and her hard work and her love for Naomi. And I think this is why, again, we cannot read this as if she's acting like a prostitute. Ruth is rightly portrayed as a woman of excellence. She has excellent character. But there's a pause in the story here. A slight hiccup in the plan. Naomi and Ruth do not know that there is another redeemer. 
one that's even closer than Boaz. And you know, you think about this in the story and how it's developing and how we make our own plans and we think how the Lord is leading and we come to this place and we might for a moment in this cliffhanger think, well, it's got to work out this way. But you know what? Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes here the other guy wins. Sometimes you get passed over for the promotion, etc. But here we see that there's another redeemer, potential to redeem Ruth. Pick it up in verse 12. Now it is true I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I am. There is someone who has priority over me to redeem you. And he has to go and he must speak to this man first. Look at verse 13. Remain this night and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. Does anybody buy that? Does anybody really think that Boaz is saying, fine, good. If he wants to redeem you, I'm fine with that. No. He wants to redeem her. He says, but if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as Yahweh lives. Lie down until morning. So Boaz tells her to remain until the morning. Tomorrow he will go and he will find this closer redeemer and see if he will redeem Ruth. If he will, good, as he says. But we know what he really means there. He wants the guy to say no so that he might be able to marry the woman he loves. And I just want you to know, he tells her to lie down until the morning. Boaz's character matched that of Ruth's. Ruth was a woman of excellence and so was Boaz. He tells her to lie down at his feet until morning. All sorts of things could have happened in that dark and secluded place, but nothing did because he was a man of excellence, just like Ruth. So they lay down until the morning. And I'm just curious. I wonder how they slept. I wonder how Boaz slept thinking about his conversation with the closer redeemer next morning, thinking about this woman whom he loves. So we come to this final section, Ruth's report. Morning comes and Boaz's character shines through. Again, he sets her on her way before anyone could see and make any type of accusations. Look at verse 14. So she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Boaz, he's not trying to be deceptive. He is seeking to protect Ruth's reputation. He is a man of excellence. And so they both get up before the sun can give light to see one another. And he sends her on his way, on her way. And I'm pretty sure that getting up early on this morning was not difficult. I'm pretty sure they were both just waiting for the time to come where they would get up and he would go find this redeemer. And then he seemingly tells someone not to share her presence at the threshing floor. But Boaz can't send Ruth home empty handed. I mean, what, what a monumental night. Ruth invited Boaz to redeem her and marry her. Was Boaz just going to send her home empty-handed? Well, so he does what he's always done in the story. He sends her home with a truckload of grain. Can you imagine what Naomi's pantry looks like at this point? 60 days of bringing home truckloads of barley and wheat. And he does it again. Look at verse 15. 
Again, he said, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it and measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. Boaz measures out about six measures or says of barley. And it's estimated that a say is about two and a half gallons. So he measures out approximately 15 gallons of barley for her to take home. If you need a visual, that's about three Home Depot buckets full of barley to load up and to take home to Naomi. And so Ruth is off for home once again with a heavy load of grain. Look at verse 16. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did it go, my daughter? She told her all that the man had done for her. That last sentence there, she told her all that the man had done for her. That's translation into modern terms. She sat down with mama and they talked for a long time. They laughed, they cried, they did whatever Moms and daughters do when the daughter comes home from her first date. And she gives a good report. She tells her everything. And look at verse 17. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. She sh- <laughs> She shows her the latest truckload of grain. And why did he give it to her? Well, he he tells her that he he doesn't want her to go home to mom empty-handed. Oh, he is winning the heart of the mother. Teenage boys, you can put that in your back pocket as well. He he can't send Ruth home empty-handed. He can't send her without a gift to her mother, Naomi. What? What a man. Look at verse 18. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Naomi tells Ruth to be patient, to wait, to see how the matter turns out. And she tells Ruth it won't be long. Why? Because Naomi knows that Boaz loves her. She knows that Boaz can't rest. He won't won't just sit around and twiddle his thumbs. He is in love with her. And so she knows that he won't let time pass, that he's going to go and he's going to settle the matter. Naomi knows this. She's got a mama's intuition. All of the gifts and the kind words that Boaz has been giving and all of the grain... She knows that Boaz loves Ruth. She knows that he won't be able to think about anything other than getting this matter settled with this other redeemer. And that's where the chapter ends. How will it turn out? Will the other redeemer redeem Ruth? Well, you'll have to come back tonight to find out. Well, as we close this morning, I want to make several comments. The kindness of Boaz to Ruth teaches us how the Lord is kind to his people. Think of how Boaz has lavishly provided for both Ruth and Naomi. Protection, food, truckloads of grain, words of comfort, and now he's willing to marry her, to take her as his wife. Look, we don't need to allegorize this story. We don't need to say that Boaz is Jesus or try to allegorize this story into some sort of gospel journey here. No, this is simply how God interacts kindly 
with people who take refuge in him. Make no mistake about it, all the kindness that Boaz has shown to Ruth is from the hand of the Lord, from the hand of Yahweh. God displayed such kindness to Ruth through Boaz. And does he not show such kindness on a daily basis to his people? Through church family members, through cards, through encouraging words, through fellowship, maybe even through a spouse, your children. God, he can show his kindness to us through getting the job, maybe even getting a promotion, maybe even working out all the details of finding a place to live. God's kindness is displayed to us in all sorts of ways, through all sorts of means. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his disciples, don't be anxious about anything, not what you would eat or drink. Just as God tends to the lilies of the field, so he tends to his people. Jesus also invites all to come to him and find rest. All who are weary and heavy laden, he invites them to come and that he would give them rest in Matthew 11, 28. This is the, the kindness of God. He invites us to come to him. And God, he is so kind. He invites us to come to him and take refuge in him. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 tells us, Do you not know that it is the kindness of God that leads you to repentance? God's kindness is so amazing that he would be kind enough to lead us to repentance. And, and this kindness, it's even accentuated. Why? Well, because we don't deserve it. We don't deserve his kindness in our life. Because we are sinners. Because we have sinned against a holy God. We have not loved him as he deserves. And we have not loved others as he has commanded us. And therefore as he is a holy God, he must judge us. We are all deserving of the full weight of God's wrath. Yet, he is so kind. He is so kind to us. He makes Boaz's kindness to Ruth look so small. Is there any greater picture of God's kindness than the Lord Jesus Christ? That he who knew no sin might become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God? That he would forgive us of all of our ugly sin? I think of Nineveh, that capital city of the Assyrian nation. It was, it was such a terrible place that gloried in death and in killing people. And as Jonah came to them and pronounced God's judgment, they repented. And what did God do? He relented. He was kind to them. And he is kind to us as well that he would adopt us. Sinners, that he would marry us, his bride. And on top of all of this, he provides for our every need every day as we go throughout life. This is the character of our God. He is kind to all who seek refuge in him. May we do so. May you do so. May I do so. May we, may we all take refuge in the Lord. Yes, first, we need to seek refuge in him from his wrath that is to come because of our sin. We need to seek refuge through repenting and believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But then we must, Christians, we must turn to him and take refuge throughout every moment of our life. Teenagers, you must take refuge in him in high school and in middle school. 
Who are you going to marry? Take refuge in the Lord. What school, what college are you going to go to? Take refuge in the Lord. Young adults out there, as you go through the difficulties of raising young ones, take refuge in the Lord. What am I going to do at retirement? Take refuge in the Lord. Because the Lord is so kind to all who take refuge in him. May we do this throughout every trial and tribulation of life. May we turn to the Lord for our refuge. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the clear picture of your kindness that is displayed in this chapter. That you are kind to those who seek refuge in you. And so this day, may you help us all to find refuge in you. To seek refuge in you in every twist and turn of life. And may we trust in your kindness through it all. We pray now that your word would go and accomplish that which you have desired for it. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it has been a joy to be with you this morning, to be able to open God's word and to walk through it with you. I do pray that you would come back this evening, come back for the final chapter, the book of Ruth. Don't forget, continue to pray for our pastor as he is on vacation, for rest, and then also for safe travels as he comes back. Well, as we close our service, if if there's any type of decision or prayer that you need, if you want to talk with one of our elders, there will be several of them up here in the front. And we just invite you to come. They would love to speak with you. They would love to pray with you if that is what you need this day. Well, I'm going to ask Pastor Michael, come and let's close through a song.